Hello everyone and welcome to Sky Scholar. Today the series on the microwave background continues with the discussion of the results obtained by the FIRIS and DMR systems on the COBE satellite. I have previously written an exhaustive analysis of the COBE FIRIS measurements in this paper and I urge those who are interested to consult that resource. It is simply not possible to cover all the issues related to each satellite in a reasonably compact video series. I am trying to provide a solid overview, but for those interested in studying the details, you must move beyond the videos. In COBE, a radiological analysis, not only are details about the COBE satellite provided, but I also emphasize problems with rushing the instrument to launch and the ever-present concerns relative to water contamination in the microwave background measurements. COBE was launched in 1989 and positioned in polar orbit around the Earth at an elevation of about 900 kilometers. COBE has a heat shield, but this shield is designed to provide Earth's infrared radiation from affecting the instruments on the satellite. The shield has no ability to stop microwaves from diffracting into these instruments including the all-important Firis horn. Firis was famous for having obtained the best black body radiation curve ever, as you can see in this figure. Stephen Hawking stated that this represented the discovery of the century, if not of all time. Indeed, the Kobe authors are proud to claim that their measurements had such high signal to noise that one had to blow up the error bars by a factor of 400 just to be able to visualize them. Now that is signal to noise. In fact, it is nearly unparalleled signal to noise for such measurements. But in this regard, I have a note of caution. Powerful signals employ proximal sources. Be careful to make cosmological claims based on signals measured near the Earth, especially when the possibility of diffraction has not been eliminated. In response, many are quick to highlight that the microwave background has also been measured by the WMAP and Planck satellites. Those satellites were positioned at the second Lagrangian point, as you can see here. This point is located about 1.5 million kilometers from Earth. Lagrangian points are locations in space where the orbital motion of the body and the gravitational forces perfectly balance each other. As a result, any object placed at a Lagrange point will tend to hover about that location and stay fixed relative to the Earth. There are a total of five Lagrangian points. Located at L2, both WMAP and the Planck satellites were shielded from microwaves originating from the Sun or the Earth. Again, the satellites had a heat shield to guard against electromagnetic heating. However, neither of these two satellites ever measured the black body curve associated with the Furious Horn. They only acquired data linked to microwave anisotropy maps. Moreover, as you will learn soon, WMAP was a differential instrument, always taking differences between two channels. It subtracted the signal observed from one region of the sky from that being sampled in another region. As a result, it was incapable of obtaining the equivalent of the Furious curve. As for the Planck instrument, it used pseudo-differential radiometers at low frequency. These should have been able to confirm the Kobe Firis findings, but they never did. We will cover all of this in greater detail in later videos, but for the present, let us return to the Kobe Firis results, as they represent the only black body measurements ever obtained from space. Now, as a point of interest, the results of the Kobe Firis horn are often plotted in different ways, and this can lead to some confusion for the novice. So let us go through this briefly. Most commonly, you will see the Kobe Firis results plotted in wave numbers, as in this figure. A wave number is exactly what the name implies, the number of waves per unit distance, typically the centimeter. Symbolically, it is expressed as nu bar and is equal to one over the wavelength. This leads to a scale in reciprocal centimeters. Firis data can also be plotted as a function of wavelength, for instance millimeters, as you can see in this figure. Finally, the Firis data can be plotted in terms of frequency, typically gigahertz. Of course, all these plots 
can have differing y-axes. Typically, one will display intensity with the units involving either joules or ergs. So do not let all these depictions bother you. They are all representing the same thing, namely a black body spectrum with an apparent temperature of 2.725 Kelvin. Now the Ferris curve is also referred to as the monopole of the microwave background. That is often confusing for people, especially for those who understand that magnetic monopoles do not exist. But in this case, the term is not associated with magnetism at all. It is related to imaging. Scientific images can be expressed in terms of spherical harmonics. A monopole is an image component that has the same value everywhere on the image. Here is what the monopole looks like for one of the frequencies of the microwave background using mole weed projections for the sky. Such projections are often used to represent the celestial sphere in 2D. They trade off accuracy in angle and shape for accuracy in area. Now it is possible of course to present monopole maps for each frequency in the furious spectrum. They would all look the same but differ only in intensity which is represented by a differing color. In any event, the Ferris horn was said to sample the sky over a phenomenal range from 3 to 3,000 gigahertz or 1 to 95 reciprocal centimeters. The key point here is that still to this day, scientists have never been able to build a microwave detector which is sensitive over such a great frequency range. It is a physical impossibility. It stands to reason, therefore, that the performance of this horn was never properly documented on Earth over this range of frequencies prior to launch. I have also highlighted in this video that the Ferris horn had a smooth interior and was therefore completely unable to prevent diffracted signals from being measured. In order to prevent diffraction into a microwave horn, the edges must be specifically designed with ridges. However, that will render the horn sensitive only to a narrow band of frequencies, which is not what the Ferris team wanted. But what is more concerning is the apparent rejection of low frequency data. Remember that the Kobe Ferris horn was supposed to be sensitive from 1 to 95 reciprocal centimeters. In fact, that is what was reported in the very first data disclosure in January 1990, as you can see here. But eventually, all data plotted for the region between 1 and 2 reciprocal centimeters is removed, as you can see in this figure. The reason that this is so concerning is that this involves a low frequency end of the spectrum, that region most prone to the effects of diffraction, and also that region from which data should have been easiest to obtain. Fixin et al. present a single sentence to explain the loss of data. However, the measured emission is higher than predicted, particularly at the lowest frequencies. Keep this in mind, as it shows that not all is quite right with the Kobe Ferris data. As a result of all this, the Ferris horn is not immune to detecting microwave signals originating from the oceans of the Earth. Beyond the Ferris horn, the Kobe satellite also had six differential microwave radiometers or DMR with two channels each operating at 31.5, 53 and 90 gigahertz. Each of these pairs of radiometers measured the difference between two regions in the sky separated by 60 degrees. It was from these instruments that Kobe first reported the famous anisotropy map seen here. We will return soon to the anisotropy maps when we discuss the WMAP satellite. Before that, however, in the next video, I wish to finish with the monopole by re-emphasizing the importance of the lattice in obtaining a black body spectrum. If you enjoyed the video today, promote the channel, mention the video to your local astronomy club, support me with a like, and subscribe for more videos as we look more closely at the sun, the stars, and beyond. Comments are always welcome down below, and I'll see you soon on our next video.